Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, to our online campus we call The Vine. My name's Doug Lane, I'm senior pastor here, and I hope that you will have an experience of God through this medium of worship. We have a special guest speaker today. None other than our own Bishop Connie Shelton is gonna be bringing today's sermon, so I hope that uh, you will stay with us for the next little while as she presents God's word to us. May you be blessed richly with today's message. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to lead us in our opening prayer. As we pray together, I invite you to have your hands open like this, just as a posture to remind us of our openness to God's presence. Let's pray now together. Holy and loving God, we thank you for bringing us together today. God, we thank you that your spirit, your love is so great that you can unite us in your love even when we are apart physically. Lord, in this time, we ask that you would help us to lay down whatever it is that we've brought to this time so that we can be fully present. And Lord, with open hands, we are ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us in this time. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is TJ Mitchell. I'm a rising junior at Hoggard High School. And today I'll be sharing my testimony about my El Salvador mission trip experience. Our work consisted of two main things. One was construction of the future Methodist College, and the other was food distribution to members of the community. The day that I did food distribution, we went to a church, met up with the pastor of that church, and delivered food with that pastor. There were a set of stairs that led you up a mountain near the church with houses along that set of stairs. We stopped at the first house, gave them some food, prayed with them, and then asked if they especially knew anybody who needed some food. She said that her daughter could really use the help, so we stopped by her house and gave her some food. On the construction days, we drove back to the work site in the bed of a truck that I had never seen before back home. When we got to the site, we were mixing concrete, putting concrete in the wheelbarrows, shoving the concrete out of the wheelbarrows, putting concrete in the buckets, and then to finally pouring the concrete into a multiple support beam with some rebar. If you couldn't tell, there was a lot of concrete involved. We worked from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., took a little lunch break back at the mission house, and then worked again from 2 p.m. until 4 p.m. We worked a lot, and we were really tired some days, but that didn't stop, stop us from having some fun. Some of the activities we did included playing soccer or football, visiting a coffee plantation, and going to an ancient pyramid, and getting ice cream in town. My favorite activity was soccer, because when we got to the field, there was a light drizzle. We didn't think anything of it. It shouldn't be a problem. Next thing I know, I was playing soccer, soaking wet in at least six inches of water. I also enjoyed the coffee plantation, because we got there, got a little bit of lunch, did a little hike into the top with a beautiful view of it. We experienced the local culture in many ways while we were there, including my favorite part of their culture, the food. One of the, on one of the last nights, we went to get pupusas. Pupusas are corn tortillas stuffed with all kinds of things. I got three pupusas, including bacon and plantains, seafood, and cheese and pork and beans. We went to a city called Otaco to buy some things and to also look around. Along the streets of Otaco, there were little booths selling all kinds of things, from coffee to bracelets and even to knives. From meeting locals that helped us out while doing construction, to meeting new people on my team, and also making better friends with one of my roommates, the people there will have an everlasting effect on my life. The two locals that helped us out on the work site were Josue and Jonathan. Josue was on my soccer team, and I got to talk to him with my little knowledge of Spanish. I got to know his age and whose favorite soccer was, player was. Clearly, I don't know that much Spanish. Jonathan worked with us, and we shared labs whenever somebody would do something we all found to be pretty funny, like spill a bit of concrete. I also got to meet the bishop of El Salvador, Juan de Dios. Juan de Dios is a close friend of Pastor David, and we all got to know him pretty well. For me, serving other people is where I find God the most. Ever since sixth grade, I've honestly loved to do manual labor. 
It all started when my best friend, somebody who even went on this mission trip with me, asked me if I wanted to start mowing grass to make some money. I said yes without even really knowing how to mow. We started mowing and I've been doing it ever since that day. This summer, I got another opportunity to do some manual labor with a handyman carpenter and I've enjoyed that as well as mowing. It's really satisfying to complete a project, seeing the before and after and knowing I helped to make that happen. And to be honest, I like getting paid. When I combine my love for manual labor and my love for God, it just gets even better. I got my first experience of doing this on my sixth grade mission trip to Savannah, Georgia. We painted a house for an elderly man there, and after seeing how much he appreciated it and how much it made me feel closer to God, I loved it. After that, I went on every mission trip I could and even volunteered here for, in town for some various things. After those mission trips and volunteering, I got to go on this trip and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had and it brought me closer to God in the end and even furthered my love of service for him. Thank you to the chaperones, Pastor David and Miss Pam. With Pastor David's jokes and Miss Pam always wanted to play a game with us, it felt like there were just two other kids on the mission trip. They also made sure we were always doing the right thing and being safe. And thanks to all of you, Wrightsville. Without your endless support, I would not have been able to have this great experience that I will cherish forever. Thank you. When God dips his pen of love in my heart And he writes my soul a message he wants me to know His spirit all divine fills a simple soul of mine When God dips his love in my heart Well, the said I would tell it to a so how he brought salvation and he made me whole, but I found I couldn't hide such love as Jesus did in part. Well, he made me laugh and he made me cry. Was a sinful soul on fire. Hallelujah. When God dips his love in my heart. Well, sometimes though the way is dreary, dark, and cold, and some unburdened sorrow. His love in my heart. He walked up every step of Calvary's rugged way, and he gave his life completely to bring a better day. My life was steeped in sin, but love he took me in. His blood washed away. Hello Church, I'm Eun Soo Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is a great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy God, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and praise. You are the source of all wisdom and grace, and we marvel at the depth of your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that we are not alone. You watch over us, guide us, and lead us on your righteous pathways. When we stumble and fall, you lift us up and gently place us on that pathway again. When we doubt, 
You surround us with your mercy and peace, reassuring us of your presence. Keep our hearts and minds open and ready to serve you. You have called us to be your church. We ask for your transforming love that we might be better witnesses for you. Transform our hearts that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we may see your grace. Transform our hands that we may serve others. Transform our spirits that we may be the body of Christ. Gracious God, we are filled with gratitude for the presence of Bishop Connie Shelton among us. We ask for your guidance and inspiration to be with her as she leads your people in North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We ask for your anointing to rest upon her so that her words and actions may touch the lives of many and reflect your love and grace. Loving God, we offer you both our joys and concerns so often intermingle in our lives. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our heart. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Hold your people with your arms. Pour out your merciful goodness for these situations and these loved ones. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have time to offer our hearts and gift, I'd like to remind you that you can give the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website, smartphone apps, and mail. Let us continue to worship our God. He shared it with others. He taught others. He, um, he 
he was a great teacher, a great leader, a great king. And that's what God wants us to be. God wants us to, he gives us wisdom so we can share it with others. Your teachers have a lot of wisdom. And this year they're going to challenge you with a lot of cool things to learn. Right? It's going to be, it's going to, what? They couldn't be a teacher if they don't have a lot of wisdom. That's right. They couldn't be a teacher without a lot of wisdom. So this school year, it might be tough at times, right? You might struggle with some new subject matters that you're learning. You might have a really hard test. But God is going to give you the wisdom you need if you just ask for it. And he will, he will give it to you and pray. So I have a little uh, gift for everybody today. You get a little keychain that hooks on your book bag. Yeah, and this is to encourage you during those tough times of school that God is always with you and that your church family loves you and is praying for you and wants you to have an amazing school year. And don't get frustrated and don't give up because you can do it. And God is always with you. All right, can we say a little prayer? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your promise to give us wisdom. Help me make wise choices this school year and help me to be wise in all that I do and all that I say. Bless my teachers with wisdom and patience as they teach me and my classmates. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I hope you guys have a great school year. Bye. Bye. It's truly an honor and a privilege to have Bishop Connie Shelton delivering today's sermon for us here at Wrightsville. Bishop Shelton has been in North Carolina many times. This is, this is not her first go-round to our great state. She first came as a student at Duke Divinity School. In fact, we overlapped for a year. Her last year was my first year. And then she and her husband, Joey, came back years later and served as the directors of the field education department there at Duke. And in so doing, she helped uh, new pastors find their first taste of what it's like to be a minister in a local church. And in some ways, not only did it prepare those pastors, but it prepared her for making appointments as a bishop, now that she's making appointments as full-time pastors to churches as well. We are so blessed to have her as our bishop. She started just this past year, January 1, after being elected last November at the Southeast Jurisdictional Conference and has served us uh, so well over these last few months. And I just really want you to get to know her better. Um, she's been a fantastic minister, not only in Mississippi, serving uh, multiple appointments, uh, serving churches of various sizes, being a district superintendent, having a radio and television ministry. Um, she's done it all. And now she brings all of this experience and giftedness to us here in North Carolina. So I want you to uh, welcome our Bishop Connie Shelton as she delivers today's sermon. Thank you, Doug. What a gift to be at Wrightsville. What a joy to be in community with all of you. So here's my story. I'm the daughter of a mailman. When I was growing up in Picayune, Mississippi, before seat belts and black boxes in mail trucks, I stowed away next to my daddy in his mail truck. My daddy, a city letter carrier, would pick me up from my half days at kindergarten and let me perch in the middle of the mail tray and hand him each stack of mail for the next mailbox. Forever etched in my memory is the expectancy of the people to whom my dad delivered the mail. They would be waiting at the street by the mailbox with their request. Mr. Ronnie, do I have a letter from my son? Mr. Ronnie, is my check here yet? Now, younger folks, I can imagine this whole concept of waiting to receive a message is hard to get your head around. With social media, texting, and 24-hour cable news, waiting for a message? seems archaic. Yet for the early church, as they are being formed in their new identity, the message that comes here from Paul's letter in Romans 
it took some time to be received. Every letter was initially a pastor teacher written letter, a response to a particular group of believers whose circumstances provoked a spiritual crisis and they needed a theological clarification and a practical resolution. The letters or epistles were never penned as a biblical writing to be read perpetually by the whole church for theological understanding. We are called to read the letters with humility. Since we are far removed from the historical, historical world that they were delivered toward. And remember to whom Paul's great letter was sent. As N.T. Wright says, Paul was coming to Rome with the gospel message of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the Lord of the world, claiming that through this message, God's justice was unveiled once and for all. Rome prided itself on being the capital of justice, the source from which justice would flow throughout the world. So without losing any of his deep-rooted Jewish meanings, Paul declared that the gospel of King Jesus is a deliberate challenge to the imperial pretension. Do you hear that? So as we're listening to this letter, Paul is doing this with great intent, challenging imperial pretension. If it's justice you want, Paul implies, you'll find it, but not in Caesar as Lord, but in Jesus as Lord. This letter narr narrates what kind of community is created by hearing this letter by embodying this gospel message. It's a community that reflects God's intention that Jew and Gentile come together as one worshiping body in Christ. Remember, Paul is a Pharisaic Jew and a Roman citizen who persecuted the first followers of Jesus for relig religious reasons. So this message that Paul preaches reflects in this letter his new understanding of bringing disparate and divergent groups in common worship and mission. So no matter that this moment of ours is worlds away from the ancient world, the reality of bringing disparate and divergent groups of people together in common worship and mission can be heard and interpolated here. So I'll be reading Romans chapter 12. I'm gonna be using Eugene Peterson's The Message so hear the word of the Lord, this letter from Paul to the early church at Rome. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace. It's important that you not misinterpret yourselves. Hear that? Misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part 
gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of Christ's body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So those of you who have been church in church for a long time or your whole life, you may remember the King James Version of Romans 12. This is kind of what's in my childhood brain. I beseech you, you remember? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I kind of like Eugene Peterson bringing it to today, right? So let's hear it now. Take your everyday ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. That's quite the invitation today. We live in a world that loves the sensational, the shiny, the beautiful, the trending. Paul invites us into a culture of divergent people who experience the holy in the extraordinary, the holy in the ordinary, the holy in the water, in the bread, in the juice, in your life and in mine. So take your everyday, ordinary life. Ordinary is good. It's not less than. Kate Bowler, Duke Divinity School professor and author of Everything Happens Project, reminds us to attend the lives we actually have. And she has a book by that name, Offering blessing, Blessings for Our Actual Ordinary Lives. Are you in touch with your ordinary life? What? How? How do you get in touch with your ordinary life? It's important that we explore that because sometimes it's as simple as, hmm, what keeps you up at night? What are you really afraid of? What gives you joy? What concerns you about the world, about your family, about your church? Growing in our self-awareness or our in emotional intelligence is a path toward knowing our ordinary life. So know your ordinary life so you can take your ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. When you give an offering, a sacrifice, you know, maybe write a check, have an auto deduct that goes to your church for your tithe. Some of you may give your stock dividends to your church or you throw your change over into the offering plate. However it is that you make an offering, think of the characteristics of that. To make an offering is to release to God, to give without control, to trust. So when we hear this passage, take your life and make it an offering of God to God, are we willing to say, I give without controlling God? 
I give you my life. I place it before you. I trust you. The writer goes on to say, when you do this, embrace what God does for you. Because it's the best thing that you can do for God when you make your life an offering. Paul goes on to say in this letter, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I wonder what comes to your mind when I say that. Don't get so well adjusted to your culture. How do we even know what our culture is? The best way I've found to understand the distinctives of my culture is when I've traveled. How about you? When you go to a place, a foreign land, when you get on a plane and go and use your passport, all of a sudden, at least for me, I find all of my cultural arrogance. I wonder, why do they eat that? Why do they dress like that? And all of a sudden, my world that has become the axis is diminished, and I see myself as part of something bigger. I begin to honor my small place in a world filled with God's people. Travel often helps us to break out of our well-adjusted cultural arrogance. Perhaps travel is not a part of your life. Make a friend with someone from another place. Aren't we so grateful to have Unsu on pastoral staff here? She helps us to see ourselves for who we are. She asks questions that convict us of why we do what we do. What a gift to have someone from another place to keep us from adjusting to our culture and seeing perhaps a path of God that looks different. I had a friend a few years back who lives in England, and her voice continues to pierce my heart when she said to me, I won't try to use my British accent because it's horrible, but she said, why do you Americans take so seriously drying your towels in a, an electric dryer? You are hurting creation. Or are y'all so arrogant you won't hang your undies out around the house because you don't want someone to see them? Friends, that's convicting. Do we choose convenience over caring for creation? Sometimes it takes someone out of our culture to help us see a bigger picture. Values, importance, get to know somebody in a different place. But you don't have to have someone from another country Perhaps you need to go get to know somebody in a neighborhood different from your own to see the foods they prepare each night, to see how they stretch a meal on a dime, to see what school supplies they're in need of. Let's not get adjusted to our culture. Let's not be too comfortable because the writer says, fix your eyes, be attentive to God. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You'll be changed from the inside out. How does that work? The writer goes on to say, then every one of you that does and writes full, I've, I've come to know you and those of you watching beyond writes full, I've seen the grace that you have embodied. Paul says, as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. You know, my interpretation of that, get over yourself. If you're near someone right now, just turn to them and say, get over yourself. Sometimes we believe we possess, we are taking this goodness to God, and we sometimes think we're taking this goodness to others. Friends, joining God's mission is not us taking Jesus to people. We go and find those least and last and forgotten and realize Jesus is already there waiting for us. 
we come to know Jesus in those places. It takes humility, friends, to live the grace that God has given us through Jesus Christ. That's what this whole letter, it's pulsing. It's grace. It's undeserved favor. It's unconditional love. And we are invited, church, to be the body that God sees us to be, the body of Christ. The writer says, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. Now there's the dilemma, isn't it? Do you ever wrestle with what's my role and what's God's role? I think it's at the heart of being church. But let's always remember it begins with God's grace. It's always God's initiative toward us. And anything we do, we're simply responding because God's given us the grace to respond to God's grace. A way that I check that in myself is praying the serenity prayer. Do you know the prayer? God, grant me the serenity. God, grant me the peace to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's our calling. Lord, give me acceptance. Give me courage. But most of all, give me a discerning heart to know when to step in and when to wait when to trust you to reconcile and make all things new and when to step in and participate with you because there's no one size fits all church. Our last piece of this passage that I'll hit on today is each of us finds our meaning and function as part of the whole body. We're nothing by ourselves. We're everything when we function in the role, the giftedness that God has entrusted. God has entrusted to you a spiritual gift or more than one to function in the body. It's not for you, it's for the common good. We're all entrusted something to function as the body of Christ because of God's grace in us. I love camp meeting. Have you ever been to a camp meeting? I'm from Mississippi, I've been to a camp meeting. And we have these historical sites and their tabernacles with sawdust on the floor. And I remember one evening I was going to lead a camp meeting and next to the big tabernacle is a sanctuary, but there's a distance that you have to walk through the grass to get to the tabernacle. And before I could leave the sanctuary, a storm came. It was lightning and thundering and the rain was coming down. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to run through the rain to get to the tabernacle. And I was so afraid so afraid and I run through the rain and the lightning and I'm drenched and I get into the tabernacle and the people had already begun to sing and in the midst of the storm the peace of Christ poured over me and I was no longer afraid because in community as the body of Christ we see that there's more than enough because God's grace holds us church sometimes we wonder what's the next step where do we go from here you may have to wait at the mailbox for a minute for the message to come you may have to wait as the early church did to get clarity on the message but God is faithful and in the midst of the storms when we live in community God's peace will hold us until the rains lift God sees God knows God's grace message is coming toward you wherever you find yourself right now. You're not forgotten. Let us pray. Oh God, we are so grateful for your grace that holds us, your grace that pursues us, and your grace that makes us community to be the body of Christ. May each one, the sound of my voice, experience your presence and comfort and peace because we know you are at work in each one beckoning and trusting and inviting 
deeper relationship with you and community. Receive the gifts of our hearts. Receive the spiritual gifts that we offer to your church. And may we be found faithful because of your faithfulness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What a gift to worship together today, and I hope that you will take your ordinary life and place it as an offering before God this week. Go now in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>